So we're getting toward the end, actually. We are getting toward the end of the story of us, Acts. It's the beginning of the history of the church. It's our foundation. Uh, and as we've gone through Acts, we have seen we've seen humanity, basically. We've seen, uh, we've seen the redeeming work of Jesus Christ working in people's lives. And we have seen the, the influence of sin continue to work its way in the church. And we've seen the church have to deal with all sorts of things like arguments over whether or not to take somebody with you. And, and what kind of things do uh, people who aren't Jews have to do to be Christians and things like this. There's been all sorts of stuff that, if we look at it, turns out to be the same stuff we always have to deal with. And so we've gotten a lot of good examples now. Today's reading... Uh, Paul has uh, went on, it's been divided into three missionary journeys, and uh, today's reading is the end of the third missionary journey. He's in a city called Ephesus, which later, and we'll see, he writes a book to them, that book is called the Ephesian, Book of Ephesians, and um, so he's speaking to the leaders in the city of Ephesus, and this is the last time he's going to see them. And so these are kind of his parting words. And when you have parting words, you want to say what's really, really, really important. I remember, uh, um, anybody here like the Batman series? <laughs> so Batman Begins just came on Netflix. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, Bruce Wayne's dad gets shot when he's a kid. And uh, in, the, in this particular incarnation, the last thing he hears is don't afraid. That's the one thing his dad wanted to tell him more than anything else. Don't be afraid. And it's because he was dying. He had one chance to say one thing. So this is Paul's chance to say one thing. And it's in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. And uh, if you want to, if you're following along in Acts, or if you go to the Bible study, you can go through the whole reading. Uh, the reading that's, that goes along with this week is Acts chapter 19, verse 20, through uh, chapter 20, verse 38. But this morning, we're just going to concentrate on Acts 20, 17, 38. So here we go. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold... I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, and not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit has told me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know... That none among you whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of all the blood of everyone, because I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he has obtained with his own blood I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease for day and night to admonish every one of you in tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's gold or silver or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands worked for my own necessities and with those who are with me. In all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak. And remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see him again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Wow, what a powerful scene. I don't know if you... Uh, I think probably everybody in here has had some of those partings, the, the difficult partings where you know you're not going to see someone for a long time. I remember uh, seeing my girlfriend off on a plane to go to college. Not Kelly, this is a long, long time ago. Eons ago now. But I remember how hard it was to give her the one last hug and let her walk down the jetway and see her back turn. It was difficult. This is a difficult moment for them. They're never going to see Paul again. And he's been living among them, teaching for three years. And so he's pouring his heart out. He's like, I have one last chance to tell you what drives me, what, what motivates, what changed my entire life. And, then, and, and what he says is about these words. And he's, he talks like a person who's scared. Not, not, not scared like, you know, he's concerned. He's very concerned about what might happen. And so, you know, this, I think it's, it's not unreasonably being frightened. And this is, of course, Halloween. So this is the month of being scared, right? I mean, that's, that's part of what Halloween is about, being scared. And so we're talking about what Paul is scared about. He, he's not scared about demons or, or people in masks. Well, he actually is scared about people in masks. I'm not thinking about it. Because that's what the word hypocrite means, is someone wearing a mask. And so he is scared about people in masks. But the mask they wear is the mask of self-righteousness. It's not the mask of a ghoul or a goblin or a, uh, a clown or anything else like that. He says, they're going to come among you. He says, after the, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. So what are these twisted things? What, what is, what's the thing that Paul wants to make sure never, ever, ever gets messed up? That's the question. What does Paul want to make sure never, ever, ever gets, up, gets messed up? And he actually, when he was in Rome in prison, he wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, and he wrote to them this. Which, which I think, uh, it's one of the most famous Bible passages. And I think that it, it, he's reminding them of the kind of thing he was scared they would lose. It's Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. And he writes to them, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of works so no one can boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I want to dissect this verse just for a moment because there's two pieces of it, and Paul writes it in order on purpose, I think. The first thing is the grace. You have been saved by grace through faith. And whose doing is that faith? Who did it? It's God's doing. It's not the result of your works. There is no boasting. Your being accepted by God, part of his kingdom, part of his family, your being able to live in peace, it's not your own doing. It is something God hands you freely in Jesus Christ, which is the thing that's going to set us free. Because as soon as you think it's your doing, and you get a good look in a mirror on a really honest day, then you're going to realize, well, I ain't quite doing it, so I guess I don't quite get peace. That's what happens if the word gets twisted. But Paul writes to the Ephesians after he's in prison in Rome, and he wants to make sure they're keeping the first thing first. And he says, you've been saved by grace through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a, I mean, how many times can he say it? It's grace. It's not your own doing. It's a gift. It's not a result of works. That's four times. I mean, how much can you emphasize one point? Now, he says, and, and again, we are his workmanship created. Nothing creates itself. Things have to be created. Nothing creates itself. So, so everything points back to what God has done. But 
He has done for a purpose. We haven't been saved so we can be selfish and arrogant and self-serving. We have been saved. The grace has been poured out on us. Why? We are created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. So it's not about not living well. It's about why you live well. That's the whole point that Paul wants us to keep clear. Grace through faith, not your own doing. It's a gift. It's not a result of your works. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus over and over again. It starts with God's love, the creating in Christ Jesus. And lest you think that Paul's fears were unfounded. Paul had to write really strong things to some other churches. Uh, he wrote a, a, letter, a wider letter to all the churches in Galatia, and this is what he had to write there. It's Galatians 1, verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in what? The grace of Christ and are turning to another gospel. And then he writes, though that's not really gospel at all, because swapping one set of rules for another set of rules, that's not gospel. We, there's, you know, that's not good news. Okay, here's a different set of rules. And, and it kind of, you can tell that this is the one thing that really gets under Paul's skin. More than anything else is when people try to place rules on you being in the family of God. Like I told the kids, can you imagine a parent saying, if you don't clean your room, you can't live in a house anymore? I mean, now, I know when kids get to be teenagers, they start making their own decisions. Some of their decisions, you like, okay, say I'm a heroin addict and I want to bring my bag of heroin into your house. No, you cannot bring your heroin into my house. I always love you and desire you and, and want to help you and be there for you, but you cannot bring the heroin into my house, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's different. What... What we're saying is this sense of God as our Father, always desiring the best for us, always looking out for us, always wanting uh, us to know his love for us. He's astonished that we would desert that and desert the idea of grace because people love rules. People love to climb. People love to know where they are in the pecking order. People love to garner power. People love to hoard their riches. People love to find security in physical things. There's all these things that the kingdom of God wants to set us free from. And Paul talked about that freedom. And he says, I'm, so, I'm astonished you're deserting it. You're leaving it so quickly. And then he goes on. Uh, yeah, there's um, a little more further along in Galatians. Paul really... Uh, he really gets fervent. That's what I'll call it. He really gets fervent. And I want to read it to you from the message. Because the message, for those of you who don't know, is a Bible translation that's very modern. The, the translator tried to take everything and really just put it in modern language. So it's not the greatest, greatest Bible to study in the world because, you know, sometimes specific words have very, like, deep and rich meanings. And then the guy from the message chooses not to use that word. But it really, it does a good job of giving us the force of what's being written. So this is uh, Galatians 3, verses 1 to 4 from the message. And I've just got a little bit up, up there for you to follow. You crazy Galatians. Did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened. It's obvious you no longer have the crucified Christ in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was clearly before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it because you worked your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue in this craziness? For only crazy people would think that they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? I mean, it's not a total loss, but it will be if you keep it up. That's pretty strong. That's about as strong as it gets. Paul is telling them they are walking away from the core of their faith. Because what is the core of their faith? What is the core of our faith? 
are saved by grace through faith. This is not our own doing, it is the gift of God. And, and, and everybody, now Paul's afraid of the people coming from outside that want to put their rules on, but we all have a little rule person walking around inside of us too, because we all want to know where we stand. I mean, we have, Paul talks about the old Adam, the new Adam, and, and, and uh, there's um, the good that I would do, that's not what I do, and the bad things I don't want to do, that's what I do, and who could save me from this mess that I am? I mean, that's basically what he says. Who could save me from this mess that I am? And the answer is, if it was about getting perfectly straightened out according to some set of rules, then nobody could. But it's not. What Jesus does is takes the rules and he smashes the rules on the ground so they shatter into a million pieces and says you are adopted and loved as sons, not evaluated as servants. That's basically what he says. You are adopted and loved as sons, not evaluated as servants. So Paul is telling people, don't go toward the law. And even don't let that law person that lives inside of us, don't let that get a hold of you. Because that's what Satan's going to do. Satan, the word Satan means accuser or adversary. And one of his biggest tools is simply to accuse us in our minds. He wants to remind us of our feelings and shortcomings. And you have them. You do have them, and so when he says you have a shortcoming, you could say, yes, I do. Absolutely. Sure enough. But that doesn't mean God doesn't love me. Because Jesus died on the cross. And, and so what Paul is trying to get us to do is stay on the road of faith. Stay on the road of faith, which is that, uh, that we are created by God for good works in Christ Jesus, but it all starts with faith. In fact, when he wrote to the Romans, the Christians in Rome, trying to make sure everything was really clear, he tried to make this super clear. He kind of gave them a blanket rule. We don't have too many blanket sort of statements to help guide us, but Paul gave the church in Rome a, a simple, clear way to look at their own actions, look at the motivation for what they do, to help us look at the motivation for what we do and why we're doing it. And this is what he wrote. He wrote, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever comes from you thinking that you're doing this, and if you don't do it, God's not going to be happy or God's going to kick you out or whatever. If that's your motivation... I would say just sit down. Just sit down. Because whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever, just, that's something that's got to sink into us. Whatever does not come from faith, faith is trust in the love of God as shown in Jesus Christ. Whatever does not come from faith is sin. That law, that legalism, it lives inside of us all. It lives in uh, churches, it certainly seems to live in the LCMS right now. It's the idea of who is in control, who is in charge, who, how do you climb the ladder, who has authority. That's one thing we, that, that humans love. We want to know who has authority. And you know what Jesus said? He said, call no man father. Call no man father. And it didn't mean don't call your dad dad. I mean, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is as you grow up and you're, and you're no longer a child... You don't look to anyone else to be the authority you blindly obey. When you're a dad and you have a three-year-old, that three-year-old, they may try to question you, but in the end, they don't get to. They have to obey you, period. When he says, call no man father, he is saying, don't let anybody slam the law on you. There is nobody on earth you have to obey. There's nobody on earth you have to simply submit to. It's you and God. Call no man father. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Faith. Trust in God. Trust is where we find the freedom. Because we believe that God has sent Jesus to be our Savior. And so we have freedom in our lives because our sin is taken away. It's our trust in God that gives us peace. Because we're not running around trying to be good enough or smart enough or generous enough or, or available enough or, or whatever enough to please God because that's the road of the law. So it's this trust, this faith that brings us peace. And it's a trust that's going to bring us joy. Because joy, I love C.S. Lewis's definition of joy. 
It, his definition of joy, and most of us have certain things, maybe, and for some of us it might have been a while, long while since we've done this or not, but most of us can remember certain things we do where we just lose track of time. Lose track of time. You know, kids out there, uh, uh, I've seen kids making sandcastles, and they have no idea what time it is, because they're just making, they're there, that's what they're doing. And that's what C.S. Lewis says is joy. And when your life, when you live your life trusting that God just simply loves you, and that he is guiding you, and that he is causing all things to work together, your life, the worry drains out, and the joy comes in, and life is like a roller coaster, obviously it goes up and down, but it's the grace of God that's like the bars on you. And that's what makes roller coasters enjoyable, right? I mean, if I put you on a roller coaster without a seatbelt that did a loop-to-loop, would you find that enjoyable? Would you climb on that roller coaster for fun? Probably, some of you might. Think, okay, what if, I, what if I just put a rolling platform with no seat at all and let you ride a roller coaster on a rolling platform? You wouldn't do it, right? Because it wouldn't be fun because the thing that makes a roller coaster fun is that it's crazy and wild and perfectly safe. That's what makes a roller coaster fun. If it wasn't safe, it wouldn't be fun. And that's what God, that's part of the gift that God gives us in Jesus Christ, is that in Christ we are safe in his hands. I'm not saying people, that obviously that, that isn't true in a physical sense, because uh, historically there's been martyrs throughout history. There are Christian martyrs right now in the Middle East, People dying because they refuse to, to, to renounce the name of Jesus. Are they safe? Yes, they are. Because they are safe in God's hands. And that's what we have to remember. This is a temporary assignment. This is not where our citizenship is. It's in heaven. And so whatever we do here, even if it's in bodily danger, we are still perfectly safe. And that is the freedom, peace, and joy that God gives us. And that's why God wants everything to come from faith, not from a set of rules we feel like we're supposed to follow. Jesus came, well, with a lot of things, but I just want to, to give you four things to think about as I close. Um, the thing, Jesus didn't actually come with any rules. John uh, 1 says that he came with grace and truth. Grace and truth. Truth sets us free, because how many of you ever tried to hold on to a lie for a while? Anybody done that? Maybe you're doing it right now. I don't know. We can pray about that. <laughs> Grace, uh, truth sets us free, because, because it's, 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 uh, you're, living in a, in, uh, you're living in prison. You're trying to hold up some image of you that is not true. So truth sets us free, but truth is not pretty for us broken humans. And that's why he came with grace also. It's the grace that enables the truth. It's not the truth that enables the grace. It's the grace that enables the truth. I don't know if you've ever been in a conflict with somebody where forgiveness is needed. But if you ever want to resolve a conflict with somebody, make sure they know that, that you are desiring to forgive. You are desiring to forgive because... Because if you don't know if someone's going to forgive you, it's twice as hard to come to them and apologize. And so what God does when he sends Jesus in grace and truth, he says, here is the grace. Now come out of the shadows. Here is the grace. You don't have to hide anymore. Here is the grace. You can take off the mask. So Jesus came full of grace and truth. And the things he did, so that's the two things he came with. And the other two things I want to tell you is that he came with love and power. Love and power. Grace, truth, love, and power. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than he die, lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what Jesus did for you, and it's exactly what Jesus did for me. There's no way he could demonstrate his love for you. You, 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 you. You, Jim. <laughs> There is no greater way Jesus could demonstrate the grace that enables the truth than to lay down his life. He loves us with the greatest love that could be demonstrated. And then the last thing is the power. 
Because Jesus said awesome stuff. He did awesome things. He was like the coolest guy that ever lived. And he said that God loves us and forgives us. And to turn our lives toward God and live for him. And that's what he said we should do. And he said if we believe, we'll be saved. If we trust him, we'll be saved. But if he didn't come out of the grave, that would kind of be worthless. But it isn't, because he came out of the grave. So not only did he have grace and truth and love, but he displayed the power to do what he said. He said he can change you from the inside out. Paul talks about us all being changed more and more like Christ each day. He had, first of all, he has, the, he, he has forgiven you, and he died on the cross to show you that is complete and true and reliable. And then he rose from the grave, which shows that he had completely can keep his word on everything. And that's what Paul wanted to make sure everybody stayed straight on, is that we are safe, that, that it, it all begins with God's love. It starts with God's love that calls us home and then builds that life of good works in us as an outgrowth of love, not the other way. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I, uh, in Acts we see the Jewish people coming with their, the, the, some of the Judaizing believers in Jesus who felt that everybody had to do Jewish things to be Christians, to be followers of Jesus. And Paul utterly rejected that because they came with their rules that people had to follow to receive the love and new life that God offers in Jesus. And he utterly rejected it. And Lord, there's voices all over this world. There's voices in the Christian church. There's voices in the Lutheran church. And there are voices inside our own heads that continually try to tell us, you must do this. You must do this to be acceptable to God. You must do this to earn God's love. You must do this to be inside of God's family. We have the inside and insider and outsider voice in the world in our larger church body, and coming from inside of ourselves. Father, help us to hear Paul's desperate plea this morning to never let the rules govern the love. To never let love be knocked off the pinnacle of our faith, or the foundation of our faith. Either way, whatever works for us, individuals probably pray. But Lord, just help us to make your love and your life in Jesus the central driver of all that we do. Open our eyes to see where that law voice is coming in and where we're trying to do things and act certain ways. And that sometimes those aren't coming from faith. Open our eyes to see where the things we think of as our Christian lives are not coming from faith. And help us to step away from that and back into adoption as sons and daughters, back into your family, back into the blanket love that just covers us because of Jesus Christ, who came with grace and truth and who demonstrated love in his death and power in his resurrection. And it is in his name that we pray this. Amen.